All right, everybody, welcome into this sort of special video for ME3005. This is a video that's going to be on the last sort of example problem in the strain transformation notes, where we have a kind of a strange strain rosette on the surface of a material and how we might utilize that strange, strange sort of strain rosette to calculate principal strains uh, in what's going on on the material surface here. So I'm going to put the example problem up here just a second. And I'll just put it up for maybe five or so seconds. And if you need to copy the problem statement down, go ahead and do that by pausing the video. Otherwise, I'm just going to uh, kind of continue. So I'm going to share my screen here. I'll bring in the example problem. This is the very last slide of the strain transformation notes. And then we'll work through this particular problem. OK, so here is actually the problem itself where we have a sort of a strange strain gauge rosette where we have three gauges that are at like this equilateral triangle 60 degrees from each other. So we're getting readings from each one of these particular gauges, and I want to determine the principal strain and maximum shear strain at this particular um, point. So go ahead and pause the video if you need a second to sort of copy this problem statement down. Otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and continue with this problem. So for this problem, we're going to utilize the equations for sort of an arbitrary strain gauge rosette. And those equations are equations that I sort of popped in the very end of lecture uh, on Wednesday. And I'll bring those here and sort of remind you what's going on. So for this example, I'm going to do my best to kind of like, um, I'll just bring the picture in and then bring the information in and we can utilize that picture. So here's the picture of what's going on, gauge A, B, and C. And the additional information that I'm given here is that Gauge A is reading 1,000 microstrain. Gauge B is reading 750 microstrain. And gauge C is reading negative 650 microstrain. And I want to find the principal strains, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, and the maximum shear strain, knowing that this is on the surface of a material and if it's on the surface, that means plain stress. Rawr. So for plain stress, sigma z equal to zero, sort of the out of plain stress, but epsilon z does not equal zero. So got to keep that in mind. Got to remember that. It's the tricky bit about these strain transformations and principal strain problems. Okay. So that's what we're kind of working with here. So to execute this problem, since we don't have like that traditional 45 degree rosette, we need to utilize sort of the full um, strain rosette equations to actually calculate what are the principal strains. So the actual methodology here, and I'll just run through this quickly, is what we want to do is we want to find epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. Then use these to find epsilon 1, epsilon 2, gamma max. That's generally going to be the strategy. And then also, we'll use this information to find epsilon z, the out-of-plane strain, and that's going to be the method. All right. So the first thing that we're going to have to do is figure out these strain components that are like in this xy coordinate system. And because we have these sort of strange like alignment of gauges, we have to be careful about, about this particular process. So what we need to do is we need to use sort of the arbitrary strain rosette equations that relate the strain gauge readings that we might have, the angle of those gauges with respect to our axis of interest, here the xy axis, and uh, the corresponding equations that help us along the way. So what we need is arbitrary rosette equations. And I'm just going to bring those in here from the notes. Uh, if you need, if you want to copy these down fully, you can sort of do that. But the arbitrary strain gauge rosette equations look something like this. All right. Where in this particular problem, we're going to need to define some of these things like theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 to help us along our way. And where epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and epsilon 3 here are actually going to be things like epsilon a, epsilon b, and epsilon c. 
those are the re readings that we actually have. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's correct. Those are the readings that we actually have. And we're looking for epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. Okay. So here, epsilon 1 we'll call epsilon a, which was given to us as 1000 microstrain. Epsilon 2 in these equations is epsilon b, which is 750 microstrain. And epsilon 3 is epsilon c, which here is negative 650 microstrain. Now we also need to define these values of theta, and these values of theta are the angles that are made between the x-axis, the axis of interest, and the, the angles of our, our arbitrary gauges. So here for us, um, our general picture can give us a guideline here. So what I mean is that I need to determine what is the angle between the x-axis and gauge A or gauge 1. Also, what is the angle between the x-axis and gauge B? Also, what is the angle between the x-axis and gauge C? All right. So I think that's going to be pretty straightforward. I think we can just do that with this particular picture here. So here, if I want theta A, which in this problem is going to be theta 1, obviously the x-axis and gauge A are aligned along the same direction. They're sort of moving in the same way. So this angle here is obviously going to be 0 degrees. Theta B, which here I'm calling theta 2, is going to be this angle here, which for us is going to be 120 degrees. Theta C, which we're calling theta 3 in this problem, here is going to be this angle here between the x-axis and gauge C, which obviously is 60 degrees. Okay, so those are the three angles that we're going to need to input into our arbitrary strain gauge Rosette equations to proceed. So I'm going to just kind of recopy these with actually all the values in tow. So that's going to look something like the following. Here, this is like equation one. <clears throat> which is epsilon 1, which is the reading that we get from gauge number 1, which is 1,000 microstrain. Here equal to epsilon x times cosine squared of theta 1, which I talked about before is 0 degrees, plus epsilon y times the sine squared of 0 degrees, plus gamma xy sine 0 cosine zero. Equation number two here utilizes epsilon two or what we're getting from uh, sort of strain gauge B. This is 750 microstrain epsilon x cosine squared of theta two, which is 120 degrees plus epsilon y sine squared theta two, again 120 degrees plus gamma xy sine 120 times cosine 120. Lastly, this third equation <coughs> here is going to be negative 650 equal to epsilon x. Oh boy, handwriting. Cosine squared of theta 3, which is 60 degrees, plus epsilon y sine squared 60 degrees plus gamma xy sine 60 times cosine 60. Okay, so we see here we have three equations and three unknowns. Equation 1, equation 2, and equation 3, and we have three unknowns, epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. So we want to solve these three equations together. So solve together. And you can use whatever techniques you want. Um, maybe you want linear algebra techniques, and maybe that's kind of what I'll show here. Um, maybe you have an equation solver on your calculator, etc. cetera. Um, probably the best way to do it is to calculate what these coefficients is. 
here, these like nine coefficients for each of these leading terms, and then just do some matrix algebra to sort of calculate what the actual values here are for these particular strain values. So in matrix form, that might look like the following. Here we're going to have our vector of known values, which is 1,000, 750, and negative 650. This is microstrain equal to our coefficient matrix, which if you sort of like multiply these cosine and sine terms out, you're going to see the following. 1, 0, 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and negative 0.4. 33, 0.25, 0 0.75, and positive 0.433. All multiplied by what you're actually solving for here, which would be like epsilon x, epsilon y, gamma x, y. So if you guys have taken linear algebra, I think most of you have, all you're going to want to do is sort of <coughs> Multiply uh, the inversion of this particular matrix on the left hand side and you can come up with your answer for epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. So if you solve all of this together, you'll find that epsilon x is going to be 1000 microstrain. I mean, I think you can just sort of see this by those equations here and because epsilon x is sort of, you know, x direction is the same as the gauge in the a direction. That sort of makes sense. Here, epsilon y, after calculation, it's going to be negative 267 microstrain. And my gamma xy term here is going to be negative 1617 microstrain. All right. Now, these are just strains in an arbitrary xy coordinate system. These are not principal strains or principal or maximum shear strains. It's just the strain in this xy coordinate system. And we had to calculate that first before we could calculate the principal strains. So now let's go on and calculate our principal strains with this known information. Okay, and our principal strains, we're going to use principal strain equations to get that. And that is that our principal strains epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are epsilon x plus epsilon y on 2. Plus or minus the square root of all this stuff. On x. 2 squared. Plus gamma xy on 2 squared. Don't forget the 2 squared. <clears throat> All right, so we'll plug in our values from sort of above here to calculate what the principal strains are at this particular point. So here, let's do that. So epsilon x is again uh, 1,000. So here we have 1,000 minus our epsilon y, which um, it's plus our epsilon y, which is a minus 267 on 2. Plus or minus the square root of all this stuff. So it's going to be 1,000 plus 267 on 2 squared plus gamma xy, which is negative 16, 17 on 2 squared. All right, so our in-plane principal strains, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, here is going to be 367 plus or minus 1027. Microstrain. So these are our in-plane principal strains. Okay, so can calculate our maximum shear. 
and this is the max in the plane. Don't forget your two times the square root of all of this stuff here. Epsilon X, sorry, minus Epsilon Y. And two squared plus gamma X Y on two squared. And we've already seen this, so this square root is the same as this. We've already kind of calculated that as 1027. So all we really have to do here is just multiply 1027 by 2, and we're going to find that the maximum in-plane shear strain is just 2054. Can't wait for that year. It's going to be a banger. Okay, last bit, and this is probably the most important takeaway from this particular problem. I can't even drink my coffee because my stupid microphone's in the way. I don't need coffee. I'm not going to fall asleep. Just kidding. All right, the last bit of information here that you cannot forget is that remember, do not forget epsilon 3. All right, the out of plane strain is not zero because we're in plane stress. Oh my goodness, the out of plane strain is not zero. We calculate that as the following. You can do it in a number of ways, but the easiest way to calculate the out-of-plane strain is the following. Minus nu on one minus nu. This comes directly from the notes on, on Hooke's Law and our discussion about plane stress and plane strain. This is your out-of-plane strain. It is not zero. Oh my gosh. If you're in plane stress, your out-of-plane strain is not zero. We were given in this problem that the Poisson's ratio was 0.33, so you can just kind of put that in here directly. You can use epsilon x and epsilon y, or you could also use epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. You'll get the same thing. So these things are equivalent. You can convince yourself of that if you'd like. So you can either use the principal stresses, or you can use, sorry, principal strains, or you can use the strains in the xy coordinate system. Either one is perfectly legit. I'll use x and y. So here we have 1,000 minus 267 units here of micro strain. And you'll end up with an out of plane strain, which is your third principal strain, negative 361 micro strain. OK, so your full answer for this problem, if you want to tell all the principal strains, your third principal strain is not zero. So the principal strains in this particular problem, it's going to be uh, 1,394 <clears throat> Your next is going to be negative 361. I'm ordering them kind of from greatest to least. And then the last is going to be uh, 660. Negative. Sorry, I was doing that in my head. OK, so those are your three principal strains. All right, end of problem. Thanks for coming. Thanks for checking out this example. It will be helpful for you on your upcoming homework. See you again very soon.